not audible. Okay, you can hear me now, right? Perfect, yeah. Thank you, thanks. Um, so yes, we had a couple of people asking questions. Maybe we could address that first. Um, let's see, why did you raise a hand? You're right here. Well, yeah, um, Daniel has asked uh, what can be done because one hour is definitely not sufficient to cover each Old Testament book. And so he has asked uh, whether there's any way that people can, you know, um, gain more knowledge on each of the Old Testament books. Uh, well, nothing that we can do over here in one hour, uh, but then, you know, if you want to do a personal study, um, you can go through each of the Old Testament books at your own pace, you know, during your quiet time. And um, even as you just reflect on the different passages, you know, there would, be, there would be learnings which you would gain. If you're looking for background information about the Israelites living at that time and uh, exactly which place were they in at which point, then maybe you can get that kind of uh, factual uh, knowledge from commentaries, you know, any good... Um, uh, devotional commentary would be able to help you with in, if you want to get information about each of the Old Testament books. But if you're thinking more in terms of, you know, uh, spiritual learnings, where you are reflecting on the passages and God is speaking to you and you're gaining something from those, uh, I think, um, um, you know, just meditating on each of those chapters during your own quiet time would be helpful. Uh, there's one devotional book that has been very helpful to me, uh, and I use it even now, sometimes now and then. Um, it's a book called Search the Scriptures by Alan Stibbs. It's basically meant for personal devotions. So for each book of the Bible, and for almost every single passage in the Bible, there are a few reflection questions given. So, you know, if on that particular day I'm reading Numbers chapter 12, I would just look at that book. I would open up to number, Numbers chapter 12 and look at the reflection questions which have been posted for that particular passage. And they are questions which are best answered, you know, if you write down the answer, because as you're writing down, you can think about, uh, about what that passage is saying and how exactly to answer that question accurately. And even as you're trying to write out an answer for it, God starts speaking to you. He brings other scriptures to your mind which are connected to what that particular passage is saying. And um, I have felt that that book has been very helpful to me in thinking more meditatively on each chapter and gaining something solid from you know uh, uh, each of the uh, passages that I am covering during my devotions. So search the scriptures by Alan Stibbs. Uh, that book should be very helpful if you are thinking of gaining, um, you know, uh, practical knowledge uh, from each of the books. If you're just looking for background information about the books, about who wrote it and where exactly were the Israelites living at that point of time, that kind of stuff, that you can just get it from any uh, devotional commentary. Um, yeah, but in class, it's not possible. All we can do is a survey, which is like just a brief overview of each book. You know, so uh, details, of course, cannot be covered in the one hour. Um, uh, we had Angeline asking us um, if some more information could be provided re regarding Balak and Balaam. Um, that is something that you would have to, you know, actually read because it's it covers many chapters, a lot of detail, uh, but it's available. All you need to do is find those particular chapters in the book of Numbers and we will get to know that you know Balak was a king who wanted to bring a curse upon the people so he hires Balaam for that task. So Balaam, no, was not a follower of the living God. He was just a Midianite and uh, probably worshipped the Midianite gods. But he had a gifting. He could deliver prophecies uh, you know, uh, accurately if God choose, chooses to assist him. 
So I don't know um, in whether he was good all the time at giving words of prophecy. But in this particular instance, we see that the living God enables him to speak out the correct words. So he was able to speak accurately, even giving a prophecy about the Christ. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure what his record was. Otherwise, you know, whether he was always able to give out good, accurate words of prophecy, that I have absolutely no idea. Uh, so he was not a prophet of the living God. Yeah, so that much is clear. Um, all right. So we'll now get into Deuteronomy and that, uh, you know, those alphabets in the beginning, D, E, U, that is basically uh, the second number, you know, the numeral two. So it's like a second law that is being given. So this particular book was called Deuteronomy because the law is being repeated for the second time. The first time it was given to the Israelites was at Mount Sinai uh, when uh, the Lord gives them those 600 and uh, how many were, were they? 613 or 635? 613, 613 laws that he gave them. That was at Mount Sinai. Now, all, many of those laws are being repeated for a second time. So that word Deuteronomy in Greek would literally mean second law or a second edition of the law or something of the sort. Okay, So it's, it's basically the law being repeated once again. Why would they repeat the law once again a second time? It's because for 40 years, the previous generation has been roaming around in the wilderness and God has been waiting for them all to die because that's what they said. Oh, if we follow this God, we will all die. And so God says, fine, you know, that's, if, if that is how you see me, you know, you will have that. So he says, yes, all of you will die. But these children about whom you are saying, oh, if we take our children to the land and all our children will be killed, the Lord says, I will protect them. They will, in fact, enter the land. So uh, now God has waited 40 years for that entire older generation to die out. And now the younger generation has now grown up and now they are in a position to enter the land. But do they have the word of God inside them? That is so important. Physical uh, uh, what strength is not enough to fight any battle. We need the Lord's backing. So rather than physical strength, the amount of strength we have on the inside is what really matters. So now the second law, second time the law is given to them to remind them of how they can stay under the covering of God and live in victory. You know, we, we always uh, uh, quote from Psalm 91, right? And those very first two verses, it talks about, you know, people who, are, who have chosen to live in the shelter of the Most High. And then that second line, it talks about how, uh, you know, we are choosing to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So if you're a person who wants to live in the shelter of the Most High, if you want to abide in the shadow of the Almighty, there are certain instructions to follow. So, of course, in the New Testament, we have various instructions which have been given. And we choose to follow those instructions. Why? So that we can continue to live in the shelter of the Most High. Because you see, the Most High has got control over everything. Only what He permits can happen to us. We are so safe and secure in His arms. So, in the same way, God wanted to give this new generation a chance, a reminder of who He is. And so, the entire law is repeated to them once again. They are reminded of, the, of what they need to do so that they can be safe and secure in God and be able to live in victory and conquer all those territories which are waiting for them. And so the entire law is once again um, repeated to them for this new generation. And you have these words, do, keep, observe. These words are used 177 times in Deuteronomy. So again and again, the, this new generation is told, keep the laws of God. Observe what the Lord has asked you to observe. Do these things. Because if you do these things, you will have victory against even the most powerful armies. Because God will be on your side. He will fight the battle. And you will gain victory, even though you people are not a trained army. Egyptians had a trained army. They had chariots. 
and they had people who were specially recruited and trained up to become soldiers. When do you think the Israelites did their uh, military training? They, did they go to any military training camp? Where they were busy roaming around with their parents, you know, in the desert because their parents were too disobedient. So, no military training. Their training is going to happen on the inside. Have they prepared themselves on the inside? If they are ready on the inside, God will take care of the outside. And the same rule applies even to us today. There are some who are just naturally more capable, able to handle the challenges of life. God has given them that ability. Uh, God has given them the brains for it and all of that. There are others like us who may not really be you know, that talented or that uh, uh, influential or strong. But if we have trained ourselves on the inside and we are in tune with the Lord, Lord will take care of the details. So um, uh, these people, this new generation is being prepared for the victory which awaits them. And the book of Deuteronomy is... Um, um, mm, Sorry, um, the book, book of Deuteronomy uh, is quoted by Jesus Christ in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament book. Most of his quotations he took from this particular book of Deuteronomy. Why was it his favorite? No, it's just that for the Jewish people, they regarded this particular book of Deuteronomy the most authoritative among the five books. Basically because the book of Deuteronomy is almost like a summary of all the four books, you know, which came earlier. Um, because it kind of re uh, repeats all the things which have been the main important things which have been mentioned in the first four chapters, those instructions and laws, they're all repeated over here. So the Jewish people, the Jewish uh, leaders, the spiritual scholars, all of that, they all regarded this so I think maybe when they when they would have their final exam, you know, when they're, you know, when they're training themselves to become spiritual leaders, I'm sure that most of the exam questions will come from the book of um, uh, thing, this, uh, Deuteronomy. So for them, it was very important. So Jesus chooses to use quotations from this book to talk about himself. You know, he would say, you know, the so-and-so verse, and immediately they would know which verse he's talking about because they would almost know their Deuteronomy by heart. And he would say, you know what, that particular verse, it's talking about me. It's referring to me. So he used the book of Deuteronomy uh, to uh, explain many things to them. And not only that, Jesus also quoted from the book of Deuteronomy when he was tempted by Satan. Now, I'm sure Jesus was tempted hundreds of times. He probably was tempted more than any other human being ever. But in the Bible, we only have you know one set of temptations mentioned and for those three temptations which are mentioned all the three times Jesus takes the quotation from this particular book of um, Deuteronomy uh, so uh, the Lord would have known this particular book uh, probably by heart you know he would have memorized it and he also knows how to apply it it's one thing to memorize but then we should also know how to take those verses and apply it to our situations. And uh, so Jesus chooses to do that. Um, so this book of Deuteronomy is important. There is value in it. Um, coming to the structure of the book, we could say uh, chapters 1 to 4 uh, is one section. Because in these first four chapters, Moses you know, kind of um, reminds them, he talks about... Uh, all the way, I mean, uh, their, their ancestry, about what, has, what God has done for them in the past, their entire past history. He talks about all of that in chapters 1 to 4. And then in chapters 5 to 28, you have a lot of instructions being given, how to worship God, how to you know uh, maintain good relationships with other people, all of that. So um, chapters 5 to 28 is filled with instructions on um, uh, godly living. So, in the first four chapters, Moses is reminding them of the past. Your parents did not keep the word of God and look what happened to them. But now, you're getting a second chance. You're going to enter the land. So how should you be living? And that's outlined in chapters 5 to 28. And then when we move into chapters 29 and 30, um, it um, 
in these chapters, the people now, this new generation, after having listened to all the instructions which are given in chapters 5 to 28, in chapters 29 and 30, they stand over there in front of God and they make, they renew their covenant with him and they say, yes, Lord, we will follow you. Whatever you have told us in all these chapters, we will do it. And so we see the renewal of the covenant being done in chapters 29 and 30. And then you have the last section, uh, chapters 31 to 34. Um, in these chapters, basically, now Moses is turning over the leadership to uh, Joshua. And um, we also see in the last chapter, God you know, performing the funeral service for Moses. No human being did it for, you know, Moses. God himself personally buries him somewhere. We do not know the details of that. Uh, but somewhere, uh, you know, uh, on Mount Nebo, after Moses dies, God himself attends to his uh, body. So um, those details are mentioned in chapters 31 to 34. Um, so coming to some of the things that maybe we can look into in this book of Deuteronomy. Um, you have referred to uh, page 21 of your PDF textbook. In future, I, I suppose I'll need to keep a physical copy with me and bring it because, you know, I only have the PDF, which is in my laptop, you know, which is here, and I cannot look into that right now. I'll come better equipped next time. But then because you're an online student, Google student, it's easy. I can always put the, you know, answer to that in the stream page. So I will do that, uh, Oliver. Uh, so I will, you know, look up page 21 and I'll, um, you know, uh, post the answer for that in... Uh, in the in the Google Stream page. Um, okay, let's look at these chapters 27 to 29. That because that's basically where God gives them the list of the blessings and curses. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 28, a very famous chapter. Even today, we have um, New Testament believers, you know, uh, referring to this chapter. So. Um, I guess we would have to start off the story in Deuteronomy 11 itself because um, in Deuteronomy 11, God gives them certain instructions. Uh, maybe we can have one person read out Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 29. Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 29. Um, here in these verses, the Lord says, after you enter into the promised land, I want half the tribes to stand on Mount Ebal, and I want the other half of the tribes to stand on Mount Gerizim. And, you know, uh, uh, the spiritual leader Joshua or whoever will read out the list of the blessings and the curses, and you will agree and say, yes, now we know what the Lord has said. If we do these things, we will be blessed. If we do these other things, then we will be cursed. So um, God tells them regarding this in Deuteronomy 11. And then later on, when they go into the land, uh, you know, in the, in the book of Joshua, we see that um, they actually, you know, stand over there and they, uh, uh, and they actually proclaim what God has, you know, said. Um, Deuteronomy 27. Yeah, in Deuteronomy 27, it gives us details regarding that. Which tribes will be standing on which of the mountains when the uh, blessings and the curses are declared. Another thing which the Lord says to them in Deuteronomy chapter 27, he says... Um, on Mount Ebal, you know, you'll have to make a large, um, you, you'll have to make an altar. And next to the altar, you would, uh, you know, place a large stone. You would put whitewash or plaster on that stone. And then you'll start carving out all the words of the commandments, you know, in that stone. 
with whenever people come to give their sacrifices at the altar automatically they will look at this large stone which contains all the commandments it will be a reminder to you that god is expecting you to follow all of these instructions and live in a way which pleases him so these are all the preliminary instructions that are being given to the people to prepare them on the inside the inner training is so important god doesn't have any problem with the externals he can bring down the fortresses he can defeat the armies he can take care of those details but the inner training inner preparation of the people is important and so you know in these chapters um, god dwells on these facts he even says make a stone uh, tablet on that write out all the things because then the people will continue to remember that the inner training is important once you're strong on the inside god will take care of the outside uh, details um so that is basically talked about in chapters 27 to 29 and you know it's kind of good to be familiar with chapter 28 which gives you a list of the blessings and the curses um going maybe into another detail uh, you know from the book of deuteronomy deuteronomy the book of deuteronomy has a song now um psalms of course has got lots of songs but in deuteronomy this particular song is significant that would be our deuteronomy chapter 32 and um, even as we go through this song very very briefly it's basically an outline you know um of their past history you know moses is talking to them and he is saying uh, you know this is what god did for you but this is the way you behaved you know even though he was so kind to you and then god was angry and god punished you but now now god is ready to bless you once again so prepare yourselves and basically the entire song talks about that uh, but i like some of the verses i really like some of the verses maybe we could we could just very briefly dwell on those in chapter 32 you no know, which is entirely in the form of a song uh, which moses has composed under the inspiration of the holy spirit uh, so maybe we can look at uh, verses 10 11 and 12 uh, if someone could read out deuteronomy 32 10 11 12 okay so here um, it talks about how god took care of them and the imagery which is used over here is you know very very nice how does god take care of them it says he shielded and cared for these israelites in the in the way a person guards and looks after the apple of his eye and you know as we are familiar the apple of the eye is this black portion that we have you know in the middle of our eye the pupil uh, so uh, that is basically the apple of the eye how do you guard the apple of your eye even if i were to bring a finger somewhere near your eye immediately the first thing that you do is you close your eyes you're very very careful about how you guard the apple of your eye and it says over here that god wanted to shield them and take care of them in that manner yeah you know with that kind of a commitment he wanted to protect them and you have also very lovely imagery in the next verse verse 11 where it compares uh, god's care to that of an eagle so what does the eagle do over here it says uh, that the eagle stirs up its nest and it says it hovers over its young and that it spreads its wings to catch them and carry them aloft so what is it talking about over here the eagle does not allow the little birds to continue sitting over there in the nest and grow fat and lazy no the eagle starts stirring up the nest it starts pulling out all the you know the twigs and pieces of grass with which the nest is made it starts stirring up the nest it starts pulling out all the nest it starts technically destroying the nest why on earth is the mother eagle doing that so that these birds can step out of the nest 
and start learning how to fly. And so when the nest starts getting destroyed and the birds have no choice, the little, little birds have no choice and they have to step out and start flying. And they're unable to do it sometimes. They fail. And it says over here, what does the mother eagle immediately do? It spreads its wings and it catches them. That little bird, as it's trying to fly, if it's unable to and it starts dropping down, immediately the mother eagle comes below, spreads out its wings, and the little bird falls on the wings and it carries it back on top. That is the way God wanted to train his people. You know, um, the songs and poems that we have in the Bible, they contain lovely pictures. If you meditate on, the, on, on those word pictures which are there, it brings out the beauty of the heart of God. So, you know, he, um, Moses says, that is what the Lord wanted to do for you people. But what was your response? That we see in verse 15. It's, you know, over there, Israel is, is called Jeshurun. That word Jeshurun means the righteous one. So what is this righteous one whom God has so lovingly brought up? What does this Jeshurun do? It says Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You know, filled with food, they became heavy and sleek. They abandoned the God who made them. They rejected the rock, their savior. After all the love that God had lavished upon them, after he brought them through the Red Sea with a, with a great miracle, after he provided for them you know, food in the wilderness, after he took care of all of their needs, what was their response? Once they grew fat, they began to comment and say, oh, this food is not good enough. Oh, well, you know, what God is providing is not uh, um, you know, on time. You know, God's timetable is not, uh, it's very, very, very delayed timetable. They began to comment. They began to kick, is what it says. They grew fat and they kicked against what God, you no, know, they're kicking against God instead of, you know, appreciating him and showing him uh, gratitude. And so then it says in your verses uh, 28 onwards that God was angry and he chooses to bring punishment upon them. And uh, so it says over there, again, it's using poetic language. You know, poetic language, we, ne we never interpret it literally so when it says you know the, the trees have lifted up their hands we obviously know the trees don't have hands but it's using symbolic language to convey an idea so over here you know it says um, god says in verse 30 he says one person will be able to chase a thousand of you and defeat you and two persons will be able to defeat ten thousand of you because i am going to leave you and i will not protect you so that's the punishment which comes upon them but then again, in the last few verses, you know, um, uh, God says, even though I, have, I will be punishing you, I will also again restore you. And I will punish the, the uh, enemies who fought against you. I will punish them. So God again speaks of hope. He speaks of restoration. And then we come to these verses at the end of the song. And I think this is something that we need to dwell upon. Uh, uh, so we are looking at Deuteronomy chapter 32. If someone can read out 44 to 47. Deuteronomy 32, 44 to 47. Now, I don't know whether Moses had a good voice or a bad voice, whether he sang out the song or he asked somebody else who has a good voice to sing out the song. But basically, you know, that, that song is sung out to the people and they listen to the words of what God did for them, how they behaved and responded, and how the Lord is still choosing to show mercy even after punishing them. All of that is that song is sung out. And then this, these are the words which Moses speaks. He says, take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you in, no, in, you know, throughout this book of Deuteronomy, there are so many instructions I have given to you. Take these words to heart. Why? He explains why he wants them to really take these words to heart and pay attention. Because he says in verse 47, 
they are not just idle words for you they are your life if you actually believe in these words and start practicing them and really being obedient and trusting me enough to follow what is what it's saying in these words these are not just idle words they will literally become your life you will prosper you will be blessed if you keep these words you no know, so we may not follow these old testament instructions today but the words of god which are written out for us in the new testament we can apply this verse even to our new testament and say those are not idle words which you have in the new testament they are literally words which can become your life they can transform your life if you choose to follow them and keep them so we are supposed to take to heart these things and you know practice them um coming to another small detail in the book of deuteronomy um if you look at the 10 commandments which are written in exodus and the list is again repeated over here in deuteronomy chapter 5 so in exodus you have exodus chapter 20 which contains the 10 commandments the same 10 commandments are once again repeated over here in deuteronomy 5 if you look at the, if you compare and contrast these two lists you basically see one main difference between the two uh, you know um, the two writings in the book of exodus god tells them to keep the sabbath day and he explains to them why he wants them to keep the sabbath day uh, that is in exodus chapter 20 verse 11 if we could have someone read out for us exodus 20 verse 11 the reason that is given to the people why they should keep the sabbath it's because um god did his creation work for 6 days and everything got finished everything got completed nothing more is left lacking and so he rests from the work in the sense he stops because the work is finished there's nothing more to be done so the people are supposed to celebrate the seventh day and say yes everything that we require for life on this earth has been provided by our lord he has rested because now there's nothing more left to complete it's all provided so we will choose to dedicate the seventh day to the lord we will not do work on this day but rather we will spend this day just building our relationship with him you know so that uh, we can uh, grow in our faith and our trust so that's the reason with uh, which is given in the book of exodus why they should observe the day of sabbath but we have an additional reason given over here in the book of deuteronomy so if you can have someone read out for us deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15 did you read out the entire thing fine okay um yeah okay so here the lord has given an additional reason why they should keep the sabbath day it's because the lord has brought them out of um egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm so now they have two reasons why they do not need to do work on the sabbath day god is a god who can be trusted he is a powerful god who has not only provided in the past at the time of creation but even when they were going through a very very difficult time when they were a helpless bunch of people standing in front of a uh, of a sea which they could not cross god acted on their behalf with a mighty and outstretched arm he divides the waters he makes the pathway dry so that they can walk on dry ground to the other side god does all these great things for them so why do we observe the sabbath day we observe the sabbath day to acknowledge and say lord i am not depending on my job for my salary i am depending on you 
because you are the one who provided everything and rested on the seventh day. You took care of every detail. And the reason I'm observing a Sabbath day is because you have a mighty and outstretched arm. If I look to you, you will take care of all my needs. So I don't have to be like one desperate person who has to work even on the Sabbath day. On that day, rather, I choose to rest in you, to celebrate you and say, you are enough for my life. And uh, the Israelite people forget this concept as the years go by. They are so desperate. They want to work even on the Sabbath day. Maybe we can you know, earn a little bit of extra money. Others, how will we live in this earth? How will we survive? That is the kind of uh, survivalist attitude. But we believers are meant to flourish, not just survive. It's the people who are surviving who have to work on the Sabbath day. So yes, we don't have a fixed Sabbath day you know, in our New Testament. Uh, we don't have to follow Saturday as the Sabbath day or Sunday as the Sabbath day. But it is a good, blessed principle which God introduced right during creation time. You know, not, not, nothing to do with the law of Moses. This is not an idea which God came up with during the law of Moses. This is something which was much earlier. So we believers should select at least maybe one day in the week. If Sunday is not possible, fine. But some day in the week when you set time aside for God and say, Lord, I'm spending this day in your presence because I don't have to be so desperate that I have to earn even on this day. You will take care of my needs, oh Lord. You will provide because your arm is outstretched to help me and you are mighty and you will take care of my needs. So we honor him by setting apart a day um, or at least half a day where we are just spending in his presence to celebrate him, worship him, just rest in him and say, Lord, you are going to take care. I don't have to be desperate like the pagans who you know, have to struggle to earn. So the same thought is repeated for us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. You know, um, so... Um, Maybe we could, if someone could read out that, Matthew 6, 33 for us. Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. Exactly. All these things will be added unto you. You place the kingdom of God first. You place the Lord first. You focus on that. You take care of that. And all the rest of the things which you require will be added. What does the previous verse say? The previous verse says, it's the pagans who desperately run after these things. Because you see, they, they don't have God to help them. But we who have the Lord on our side, we don't have to desperately run after these other things. If we can just have our priorities correct and place God first and his kingdom first and righteousness first, if we take care of those details, all these other things will anyway be added to you because your heavenly father knows that you need them. He will provide. Okay, so the Sabbath is, idea is that. Not that we have to, you know, uh, set apart one day and, and uh, observe the Old Testament Sabbath. We observe the Sabbath in a different way. We do it in the Matthew 6.33 way. Where we commit ourselves to God and say, Lord, your priorities will be my priorities. So I will, I will set apart time for you to spend time in your presence, to grow in you so that I'm trained on the inside. And once I'm trained on the inside, outer battles, you'll take care of. The details are always taken care of by the Lord. Uh, so um, that's one uh, learning that comes out uh, through the Ten Commandments, um, you know, through the, through the commandment regarding the Sabbath. Um, okay, we do have a little more time. Uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, here in the class or even uh, online. Uh, yeah, we have a person here, so we'll answer that. In the meantime, if someone wants to raise a hand or type in a question in the chat, that also should be fine. Uh, go ahead, brother. Yeah. You raised your hand, right? Yeah, go ahead. Ask your question. Hey, no, you don't have to stand up. Just ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because for the second time, the, okay, the question which was asked is, why is Deuteronomy called the second law? Because for the second time, it is being repeated once again for the new generation. The older generation had received it directly at Mount Sinai, but now that generation was dead and God wanted to 
remind the new generation and so uh, it's called second law in the sense it's being repeated for the second time that's all uh, um, Uh, so when it called at Mount Sinai, okay, uh, the, the question is, uh, what exactly does the second law mean? Okay, that's basically the question which is being asked uh, here in the class. Um, at Mount Sinai, God gave did not give, just give the Ten Commandments. He wrote the Ten Commandments with his hand on two tablets. Totally, he gave 613 laws to the people, which are explained to us in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So 613 laws were given. Ten commandments is like a, it's like a summary of the 613 laws. Uh, so now, in the book of Deuteronomy, for a second time, all these 613 laws are being repeated. I don't know whether all of them were again repeated, but yeah, most of them would have been mentioned once again. So it's not just 10 commandments which were given to the Israelites. 613 laws were given. 10 commandments are just one small portion of that. Uh, so we would, yeah, so in that sense, it, uh, I, I hope that makes more sense now. Yes. Okay. Um, any other questions? Because I always have enough matter over here. I can give you another long lecture. If you have no other questions, I would like to cover one more thing. It's useful to have this little bit of information. OK, no one has posted here. No one has raised a hand. All right. Um, the book of Deuteronomy has been, um, you know, we, we just think that one day the writer of, you know, this, this biblical writers, we just assume that you know they, they would have just sat down and started writing. But no, they used their mind, their thinking, and God inspired them to write out in a particular way. So this particular book of Deuteronomy has been written in a very specific pattern. The pattern which is used for the writing the book of Deuteronomy is the same pattern which the people in ancient times used for their treaties. You know, archaeologists have discovered many treaties belonging to a to a nation called the Hittites. Um, so these are ancient, um, these are treaties which were written in second millennium BC, very, very long ago. So those treaties were made between the king and, uh, you know, the Vassal nation. Um, okay, the nations which have been defeated by this powerful king. Now, you know, those, those other kings have to now pay him. Um, they have to pay him a tribute. They have to pay him money uh, every year. And then he'll allow them to live in peace. On the other hand, if they try to rebel against him, he'll take his army and go and wipe them out. So these now these Vassal, yeah, that's the term that is used, okay, V-A-S-S-A-L. These Vassal nations are now under the control of this superior king. So he makes a treaty with these people, so these Hittite overlords they would make a treaty with all the nations which they have defeated. And the treaty will have certain uh, main features. You know, it starts off with an introduction, of course. And then um, the terms of the treaty are written down. You will do this, this, this. If you do this, 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 then I, the overlord, will help you. You know, if some, if some enemy, enemy comes to fight against you, I will come and help you in this way. So the terms of the treaty are written down. And then you have a list of benefits which the, the people of that land will get from the overlord. It also gives a list of consequences which they will face if they refuse to keep the terms of the treaty. And then finally, in the end, you will have a uh, witness section where those Hittite, uh, you know, in the, in the Hittite treaty, the overlord will say, if you break the terms of this treaty, so and so God, you know, all the Hittite gods, they'll, they'll give a list of the names of those Hittite gods and say, these gods are witnesses to this treaty. So if you break this treaty, then you will have to come under uh, judgment of these gods or something like that. That's the pattern in which the uh, Hittite treaties were written. Now, Moses writes in the same pattern 
the book of deuteronomy you have an introduction for the first four chapters he gives a, you know he talks about their past history this is what god did for you and then this is what happened he talks about that from there he moves into the terms of the treaty you now we looked at that in the structure chapters 5 to 28 gives you the terms of the treaty um, then in chapter 28 you have the list of the blessings the list of the consequences if you keep the treaty with the lord these are the blessings if you break the treaty these are the consequences so it would have made a lot of sense to the israelites when they are looking at this document because they are familiar with such things they know that the secular treaties are written in that order and god is using that same um, pattern to help them understand that he's making a formal contract with them and he will keep his side of it are they willing to keep their side because if they are willing to keep their side they can enter into the into the promised land confidently and they will have victory doesn't matter how powerful those enemies are they will be granted victory if they can keep the terms of this treaty so god wanted to convey that uh, to them uh, so these are just some of the things that we could look at uh, from the book of deuteronomy and um, so as there don't seem to be any more questions any last minute questions no ah what a questionless class okay well it's fine it's all right okay so let's just close with a word of prayer um yeah lord we just thank you so much for some of the spiritual learnings that we could gain uh, from these two books which we covered oh lord i pray oh lord that you would help us to practice and apply these truths in our life because we want to be really trained up on the inside we want to be very much in tune with you on the inside oh lord because then you can take care of all all our outer battles that you will take care of those details if as long as we are trained up on the inside because lord you have said in your scriptures these words which are contained in the bible they are not idle words they are literally our life if we choose to stand on them and obey them and practice them these words can be our very life which will cause us to live um in uh, prosperity with your blessings the way we were meant to live so help us a lot to keep your words to observe them to trust in them and follow them thank you lord in jesus name amen thank you for being so attentive and listening yeah and yeah we'll meet again next